I was thinking in singing that song, Jesus is very near. And you ask the question, how near is he? Well, he's very near, truly near. But what does that mean? Jesus, being God, is everywhere someone can be that is God. But what does it mean to you and to me? Why is that song something that's good for us? Because it's just as close, Jesus is just as close to save us from our sins as we are to the gospel of Christ, believing and obeying it. That's how close he is. And when you think of the mercy we want from God through Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by him, then we certainly recognize the nearness of Christ in the gospel. Now, if you want to be turning to this, we'll see it on the screen here in a moment. Matthew chapter 5, 1 through 12, the beginning of what we know as our Lord's Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 1 through 12. And we will notice that in uh, just a moment. The scripture reads, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So in this sermon... We will study, blessed are the merciful. And we want to study the meaning of mercy. Now, we've touched on some of that in several sermons. I even mentioned it this morning. The one who calls for mercy knows he's violated God's will. It's his fault. And so he doesn't want justice. He wants God's mercy. So we will study not only the meaning of mercy, but the actions of those who personified, who put it into practice, and the blessings. For those who are merciful people, full of mercy. So our objective is for each of us to learn what mercy is and how to practice being merciful. Hopefully then the message of the sermon will help us to develop the attribute of being merciful to others throughout our Christian race. That's part of our being like Christ as members of his spiritual body, the church. Now, we read to you verses 1 through 12, and concerning this text, we see that, as I said in the beginning, it's uh, the wonderful and blessed Sermon on the Mount. And in his sermon, our Lord teaches about, and this is important, the character of the citizens of God's kingdom. So we mention often that as, as you live like the New Testament teaches you to live, then you're building your character. You're building a character like to Jesus Christ's character. He's the one we're emulating. Well, you can't emulate him except that you do his will. So when you do his will, you're making yourself to be in the likeness of Christ. I think sometimes people don't understand that when you say, you must do what God said do in the way God said do it and for the reason God said do it. But that's the way that a free moral agent makes his character, his inward man, like Christ. If you want to be like Christ, then it's uh, like the potter in the clay. And we sing the song sometimes, um, while I'm yielding and still, make me after thy will. Because, you know, the potter or the, the pottery that you're working on in the skilled hands can turn it into something very worthwhile from just a lump of mud, you might say, or clay into something. Well, how does that happen with a person who can choose to do evil or choose good? Well, that person then wants to choose to do good as the Bible teaches what's good. And in that way, you make yourself like Christ. Now, think about it for a minute. Is there any other way a free moral agent can make himself in the likeness of Christ? There would be no way. 
So it's not a matter of saying, well, you're just commandment keepers. No, that's the way I want to become like Christ. I choose to want to become like Christ. Well, how do I do that? I submit to my Lord's will, and that makes me over after His will. So those who would be citizens in God's kingdom and those who are citizens in His kingdom should study, must study, and understand the lessons found in Jesus' great Sermon on the Mount. Now these are what's called, in the beginning of it, the Beatitudes. Somebody said, well, what is that? Well, we'll simply call it a beautiful attitude, a beautiful state of mind. This is what we're talking about. Now, a person outside of Christ and not converted to Christ doesn't form this. It takes a person who is converted to Christ, who wants to be like Christ, who wants to live as the Lord directs, to make his life over in the image of God. Now, in this sermon, we want to concentrate on, on the uh, Beatitudes, and specifically, we'll see in a moment, as I said, the uh, merciful. Blessed are the merciful. Now, each Beatitude has a form, a form. There is in each one a declaration of a blessing. We'll study more later about what it is to, to be blessed. What is a blessing? Then it has a description of that respective attitude or mindset. And then there is the disposition of blessing. How does one or how is one blessed? Or how do you as a Christian bless somebody else? So each attitude begins with the declaration of blessing. Now, the word in the Greek language for blessing is makarios. The word contains the idea of happiness. It contains the idea of peace of mind. It contains the idea of being content. Even though you may be in a state of affairs that the world can't understand how you could be content. The world couldn't understand how Christians could be fed to the lions, as it were, or burned at the stake and be singing and be praying, and be praising God while they died, because the world's anchored on the here and now, and the gratification of the appetites of the flesh. It doesn't look for a world beyond this, wherein dwelleth righteousness, where God's will is done to perfection. You'll notice that when Paul is writing about being married, and whether one should be single or not, and it's all in the scope or with the environment that was taking place then that they were Christians were in that had to do with uh, a present distress that was upon the church because they were Christians. And Paul says, regarding this present distress, you'd be better off be as I am, single. Now he says later, but you know, if you must marry, then marry. But I'm trying to tell you how you can get through this mess the easiest way possible and be faithful to your God. And so he says of, of, of a single woman in 1 Corinthians 7 40, but she is happier if she so abide, that is, abide as I am. Now, what I want to look at by saying all of that is this business of she's happier. She's happy not getting married. She's happier not being married and becoming a mother and having children. Well, isn't that the normal way things ought to work the way God intended? Indeed it is. But he's talking about this blessedness. You, you will be blessed in this given distress if you'll just stay as you are and not have the responsibilities of a mother of a wife, of a father, of a husband, and so forth. So that helps us understand more about this business of blessing, of being happier. It's happy in doing God's will and facing the affairs of this life, being on God's side. As I said in the beginning, if we make our character over in the likeness of Christ, it's when we as a free moral agent submit our will to the Lord's will, and thus that's the process of His making us like Him. Then there is the description of this state of mind, this mindset, this beautiful attitude. So we ask why? Why are these called beatitudes? Why are these called beautiful attitudes, beautiful state of mind, when really they, they may have you in a straight betwixt a lot of things because of your willingness to submit to God's will and receive persecution because you were faithful. How can you keep that attitude that the Lord talks about here? Well, these attitudes describe who we are. What we really are as Christians of Christ. We're to be 
of God. We're to have godly character traits. That's what God wants in His children. We are His family. He wants us then to show forth the attributes of our Heavenly Father and our elder brother. Then there is the disposition of blessing. Now this is the actual blessing itself. That's the reason for the happiness. So a person is a blessing to others even when they're washing that person's feet as it was in that day and time in that culture. Or we might say today either when you're carrying the bedpan. You're happy you can do it because it's good for somebody else who can't help himself. That's not normally the way the world thinks. But it is if you're learning that the greatest among you will be your servant. That's what Jesus is trying to get over. I'm trying to show you, he says, how to make yourself in the likeness of God. God became a man. How would he live if he became a man? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John will tell you. That's how he would live if he became a man. And so he sets the example or pattern for us. So this is also what we can expect will result from having the attitude described. So that's why we say doing good is the Bible defines what's good. The world may not think it's good, but doing good as the Bible describes good. And it's going to be in pouring out ourselves for the good of others. So you can be doing good to others, and they may take it as a bad thing. I think you have to conclude that when you realize the very life of Christ. His own people were shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Yet everything he did was for their good. You see that in the first Christian martyr's death, Stephen. He was there teaching them what would save their soul, but they killed him for it. Now, can you keep the right disposition of mind that Christ had when you're being persecuted for helping somebody, for giving them that which is greater than they have any idea of? Now you understand better why Christ said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They don't really understand that what I'm doing for them is for their benefit. Now, regarding this particular beatitude, several of these come from Old Testament scriptures. And many, uh, if you study the commentary and so forth, many that would be called scholars, very learned in their field, believe Jesus was referring to one particular passage in the book of Psalms, Psalm 18, and the first part of verse 25. We read, with the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful. With the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful. In other words, when you're being merciful as a trait of godliness in your life, showing forth that aspect of your character made in the likeness of Christ, then God says, I will be merciful to you. So the source of mercy is actually God himself. Thus, being merciful is an attribute of God that we ought to emulate. Think for a minute. If man could not do evil to us as God's children, how would you ever cultivate the disposition of heart or the character trait of mercy? You must have somebody wrong you before you can be merciful to them. And God set up a system in the flesh on this earth to where we can actually do that. And we can see, well, that's the way I want to be dealt with too, and that's the way I want God to deal with me, so help me to deal with others who have used me wrongly. It doesn't compromise preaching the truth to people and what they need to hear. Stephen proved that. But it means that we are willing to demonstrate toward other men what God has demonstrated toward us in forgiving us and extending mercy to us in the gospel as we believed and obeyed it, because that's the way we obtain remission of sins. We go back to Exodus chapter 34 and verse 6. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and truth. Now sometimes I see people look at these different terms and act like they don't even have a connection with one another. But they do. They do. While we're in this life as a faithful member of the spiritual body of Christ, a Christian, then we want to deal with everybody as Christ dealt with people who's the head of the church and had purchased it with his own blood. That doesn't make it easy because that means we have to subdue those passions that would say, I'd rather knock you upside the head than to do good to you. 
And sometimes we will say to ourselves, you know, wouldn't you just like to slap his jaws? Well, what are we saying? The person from justice may need that, but I don't mete out that justice. God said, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. My duty is to teach the truth, contend for the truth, beg people to obey the gospel, and all that goes along with being a godly person. So that's all laying the groundwork for this matter of blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So then what does it mean for me to be merciful, for you to be merciful? There must be somebody there that I am willing to be merciful to. Here's what some commentators have said, some of the old commentators. Barnes writes, those who are so affected by the sufferings of others as to be disposed to alleviate them. We say, I feel so sorry for them. I wish I could do something about this. Well, as a Christian, you, a lot of times there are things you can do. The Bible's full of that and talks about it being uh, what is right in taking care of the poor and the widows, orphans and others. Remember, part of pure and undefiled religion is what? To visit the widows and orphans in their affliction to keep oneself unspotted from the world. So it's, a, it's using an overworked word that began back when I was a young man. I'm identifying with somebody else. I'll think of a biblical example, and that would be the Macedonian Christians. They were so poor economically. They were in much privation. Yet the Holy Spirit had Paul say, Rich Corinthians, you need to follow their example. They gave more to help the poor saints in Jerusalem than I ever thought they could. And though it likely is not much compared to what the Corinthians could have given, it was far more than what they normally should gave. And what's, what's happening here? Well, those folks had suffered. If you read the history of the Macedonians, they had suffered in all sorts of ways in economy and every other way. And what was happening down there in Jerusalem and Judea? Great famine. People were starving. They could, in the true sense of the word, identify with those poor folks down there. They knew the misery they were going through. And they wanted to do all they could of themselves to help those brethren in that area. So that's the idea of being disposed in your mind to help the person who can't help himself. Does that help you better on what we studied last week or a while back concerning the rich man? Why Lazarus could be laid at his gate full of sores and only had the dogs to lick his sores and the rich man went in out that gate every day. It didn't bother him. There was not, no mercy in that rich man. And thus, even when he's over in the Hadean world, send Lazarus over here that he may dip, dip his finger in water and touch it to my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. He was still interested in nobody but himself. And he did not receive mercy, did he? He had already gotten himself by dying lost into a place where there was no mercy extended because he had never shown any mercy to anybody. Clark, in his commentary, says, This virtue, therefore, is no other than a lively emotion of the heart, which is excited by the discovery of any creature's misery. And in such an emotion is manifests itself outwardly by effects suited to its nature. In other words, you want to do what you can. And we sometimes say, Is there anything I can do to help? Sometimes we don't know anything else to say, but please call me if there's anything I can do. Or we show up at the door and say, uh, I know you're undergoing whatever it may be, and we want to be there to help. You know, we sometimes don't think it's very much, but when you set up with somebody, or you're there to help them out, and a family trying to work, and yet the person that's so ill, they can't be there for them. So you go, and it's not like many of you ladies have, and sit with somebody. That doesn't seem big in our eyes a lot of time that we've done a whole lot, but isn't it interesting that when you find uh, Tabitha, that the ladies were all standing around after her death and showing all these things she had made to help the poor. Well, I don't think that captured the Roman government's attention. <laughs> but it certainly was something that captured God's attention. And we sing a song along that line. If just a cup of water is placed within your hand, then just a cup of water is all that God demands. <laughs> so whatever we have that, um, that we can use, great or small, 
that our mercy, that character of God, is seen when we employ it to be concerned about the others. When sorrow passes from eye to eye, what does that mean? In other words, you're, you're hurting and you're loss or pain or whatever it is. Well, I'm empathizing with you. I'm there. You can lean on me. You notice how all these come from various songs, even secular songs? Why? Because people want that. People need that. It's what God through Christ by the gospel system and living it offers to the world in its proper way. Johnson in his commentary says, those who, instead of resenting injury, are ready to forgive. Now that touches on what I said uh, Wednesday night. I do not know how you can be a Christian. That means of Christ, again I say. And you want to help people as the Word of God teaches us to help them. Whatsoever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him, Colossians 3.17. And you don't want to forgive those who are in need of forgiveness. There's something wrong with us. But we know, because we know the book, that we can extend that forgiveness when the other person is a free moral agent refuses to acknowledge the sin. We're ready. We want to. We have the same attitude God has because that's what we're here to do is to develop that attitude. And He's willing to forgive anybody. He wants to forgive everybody. A person dies lost, that doesn't make God happy. It doesn't make Him happy at all. He above all knows what's going to happen to that person who dies lost. But then we cannot go against the person's will who refuses to acknowledge the sin and seek mercy. Remember, mercy is what the person wants and strongly desires who knows he's a sinner. He's a sinner because he chose to be a sinner. And now he's recognizing the consequences of that and he doesn't want it. But once done, done. So what can he do? Cry for mercy. Have mercy on me. So many said in Jesus' earthly ministry, Thou son of David, have mercy. The Bible uses the word and You'll see that in your study of it, as I read a while ago, it involves love. In Ephesians 2 and verse 4, notice how Paul writes to the church there. They heard, they believed the gospel, they had received the mercy of God and forgiveness of their sins and obedience to the gospel. But God being rich in mercy, for His great love, wherewith He loved us. You cannot remove the love Paul discusses in 1 Corinthians 13, that is the love of John 3.16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son from His mercy. You can't do it. But that's our God. God is love, so God is mercy. He is love that seeks always another's highest good. And when it comes to salvation or sin, it's salvation from sin, then He wants to extend that mercy. God wants to say, I forgive you. But being a free moral agent with a will, we have to make up our mind that we want God's forgiveness. And it's true even when we do something wrong against somebody. You have to want their forgiveness. Now, on the other hand, what if we don't want to forgive? Well, then that puts us in a bad light. Because God has never been that way. Christ is never that way. He always is ready to forgive. Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my, notice the take, the will of the man being a free moral agent. I must comply with, the, with God's will. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Watch it. Ye shall find rest under your soul. So it involves satisfying needs. The prophet Isaiah, chapter 49, verse 10. Notice the prophecy. They shall no longer hunger nor thirst, neither shall the heat nor sun smite them. For he that hath mercy on them will lead them, even by springs of, wa by springs of water will he guide them. In other words, he'll take care of you. We ever sing that song? God will take care of you. Well, that hearkens to Matthew 6, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So all this involves forgiveness. This mercy does. Daniel 9 and verse 9 reads, To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against Him. Now notice what I've been saying about this. There is the acknowledgement, we have rebelled against Him. We need His mercies. We need His forgiveness. Now what's wonderful about it, God's saying, I'm ready when you're ready. I stand right here ready. 
So it also involves not only those that love us and make mistakes, but it involves our enemies. In Luke chapter 6, 35 and 36, we read this. Jesus speaking, but love your enemies and do them good and lend, never despairing, and your reward shall be great, and ye shall be sons of the Most High. For he is kind toward the unthankful and evil. Be ye merciful, even as your Father is merciful. In that plain, right there, read thousands and thousands and thousands of times. So when people want to hurt you, that doesn't mean you don't defend yourself in the sense of teaching the truth and they charge you with error. Or they charge you with some conduct that's not true. Jesus did that and he was sinless. He defended himself. But at the same time, it says, you're ready to forgive the most wicked people when they comply with heaven's mandates. So in short, mercy is the outflowing of love that seeks to satisfy another's true needs with a willingness to forgive their faults. Again, you see it in Stephen who emulated the Christ in the way he died. Father, lay not this sin to their charge. And remember Paul saying concerning his brethren according to the flesh, Israel, that I could wish myself to be a curse from God if he'd save them. Now that's a mouthful. I wish myself to be a curse from God if it would save them. Merciful. Mercy. Love. It never involves compromising the gospel because that's the only hope we have. It's God's power to save, Romans 1, 16. But it means that all those who fight themselves in disobedience to the truth and opposing those that teach them the truth, we still stand ready to forgive them if they finally come to a point where they humble themselves and obey the gospel. Now the question is, who are the merciful? Who are the merciful? Well, the one who provides for the needy, I mentioned that in James 1, and verse 27, that person is a merciful person. But there's needy physically and there's needy spiritually. When you look around about you, all these people caught up in false doctrine, don't you think they have a need? They have a need to know the pure gospel of Jesus Christ. When Paul wrote the first chapter, as we have it, in the book of Galatians, writing to those churches of Galatia, he was surprised that they were departing so quickly from the gospel that he had preached to them. And he was fulfilling a need. Because he declares to them their state of affairs in departing from the gospel and following a gospel of a different kind. In Psalm 14, 31, He that oppresseth the poor reproacheth his maker, but the, he that hath mercy on the needy honoreth him. Now, if that's the case when it comes to poor who cannot provide for themselves, what do you think that says about all these unborn babies that have been murdered? and they continue to be murdered up to this day. Don't you think that the people who cannot speak up for themselves, who cannot defend themselves, need somebody to rise up and do it for them? And if unborn sweet little babies don't need, don't need to have someone to speak up for them, who does? Who does? And yet look at our nation. There's not an abortionist on this earth who's merciful. Yet he will present himself as merciful by relieving the mother who couldn't control her appetites and got herself into the mess by murdering, murdering her baby and then saying, well, now you're free to go and do what you want to. You're relieved of all this problem. Well, that's not mercy. Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar to practice mercy toward the poor to end his iniquities, Daniel 4.27. Listen, wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee and break off thy sins by righteousness. Now stop there and think about that a minute. Break off thy transgressions of God's law against God by doing righteousness. Well, all of God's commandments are righteousness. Psalms 17, uh, 119, verse 172. Well, if I break off my sins by doing righteousness, what does that mean? You break off your sins by doing what God told you to do. And thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if there may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. Again, it's saying whatever it is, stop doing what's contrary to God's will. Be concerned about those who don't have what you have. That can be spiritually or physically. 
and then start doing what's right, as the Bible defines right. The one who tends to the sick is merciful. It's touching on what I said even earlier. On numerous occasions, Jesus showed his mercy to the sick. Why is that in your Bible? And what do you get out of it that's going to help you be what God wants you to be? Matthew 9, 27 through 30, And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying, saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? They said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that you didn't tell anybody. Don't tell any man this. Concerning um, the same thing in Matthew seventeen fifteen, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffereth grievously. For oft times he falleth into the fire, and oft times into the water. I remind for those folks who don't have what we have. Some of us have been born, and we may think we're lesser than others. Maybe some of us were, but we have so much more than what other people have. Now, I don't just mean financially or in material things. That's true, too, in so many cases. But look what we know about the Bible and Bible things that so few people around about us have no knowledge of whatsoever. Now, what does God expect us to do with that? Well, he wants us to be merciful. And spread the truth, just like Stephen did. The one who pardons the guilty is merciful. David, in pouring out his heart in penitence before God for his sins against God with Bathsheba and other matters connected thereto, in Psalm 51, verse 1, said, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. Well, now I get just a little bit of view of the biblical definition of kindness. How was David wanting to see God's kindness extended to him? By his mercy, by his willingness to forgive him of the sins David knew he had committed against God. Notice, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Then Psalm 123.3, Have mercy upon us, O God, have mercy upon us, for we are exceedingly filled with contempt. That's what it takes to get that mercy is to realize just what you are. And a lot of people won't do that. So these are they who are truly merciful. Well, now, why is it a blessing to be merciful? Well, the simple answer is because it's an attribute of God, and if you want to be godly, you put it into practice. Psalm 86, 15, But thou, O Lord, art a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and truth. The prophet Joel in chapter 2 and verse 13 reads, And rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. That is, the repenteth here is not like man repenting of a sin. It means God's the same. You obey him, he blesses you. You disobey him, he punishes you. If you want him to restrain the just punishment that you ought to get, then be humble and contrite and repent and do it just like he says right here. So we read... What a wonderful thing in Joel, and I could spend time going into the Joel the prophet and the state of Israel when he worked with them. We'd understand that better. So this is because it's an attribute of God. It means it's simply the right thing to do. Why do you do certain things? It's the right thing to do. It's right because God said that's what you ought to do. Well, I can't explain any more than that. It's God's will. I'm God's child. Why are you doing it? Because it's the right thing to do. Why is it the right thing to do? God, my Father, told me that's the right thing to do. If we desire to be like God, then we will be merciful as God is merciful. In Luke 6, 36, be ye merciful, even as your Father is merciful, because God desires mercy and not sacrifice. Our Lord said in Matthew 9, 13, but go ye and learn what this meaneth. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous but sinners. What does that mean? It means we recognize the lost condition people are in and they're in it because they chose to sin and they sinned against God. Same is true of us. Well, if we want God's mercy, then let us learn to extend that mercy as the gospel presents God's mercy to all people everywhere. Then we may say that because mercy satisfies the golden rule of doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. 
Others are aided as we would want to be aided. Let me ask you this. As you go to where, in our reading this morning in the scriptures before worship, had to do with Paul withstanding Peter to the face because of Peter's sin when he was in Antioch. Would Paul want Peter to do that for him if he had sinned? Of course he would. But you see, a lot of us in the church, we can't admit that we're wrong and somebody loves me enough to come and point out my wrong. We just can't do it. And all that does is prove what? I don't have that character like I need to have. You know, we fail to talk about a lot of times about Peter's situation when Paul was him in the face because of his sins. There's no indication in the Bible that Peter didn't just say, you're right, Paul. Later on, he'll say and call Paul, our beloved brother Paul. Well, I found out over the years as a preacher sometimes if you confront people with their sins because you love them, you don't want to go to hell. You want them to repent. You want them to be under God's mercy. But they don't pretty much take that same view. And they're not apt to call you a brother beloved. When we show mercy to others, they receive what is needful from us. In the parable of the Good Samaritan found in Luke 10, 25 through 37, here's what we read. And he said, He that showed mercy on him, and Jesus said unto him, Go and do thou likewise. Well, that is teaching us something. And what does it teach? And we will be blessed because Jesus said it is more blessed to give than to receive. By the way, he didn't say it's not a blessing to receive. He says it's more blessed to give than to receive. Acts 20 and verse 35. Now, who is our example in giving? Jesus. Can't get a better example than that in giving. Now, what do you think that's going to make in your life and mine if we strive more and more every day in our circumstances and situations to emulate the giving Christ? Because we will, in turn, receive mercy by being merciful. Our beatitude today, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy, Matthew 5, 7, is one that we will need all our life. If we don't show mercy, neither will we receive mercy, James 2, 13. Scripture reads, for judgment is without mercy to him that hath showed no mercy. Mercy glorifieth against judgment. Who are the merciful? Well, God's people are going to be the merciful for they care about the truth. They care about God and they want God's mercy. They know the importance of such things and they want to live the kind of life that will take them to heaven and that they will be able to be in a place where that mercy is brought to fruition and they are like Christ. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without variance, without hypocrisy, James 3, 15, 17. Closing in Hebrews chapter 4, 16, let us therefore draw near with boldness unto the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and may find grace to help us in time of need. God wants us to have mercy on others. We ourselves need God's mercy, so let's draw near and do what we need to be able to receive the mercy from God we all desperately desire. If you're not a child of God today, we urge you to believe with all your heart Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, to obey the commandment to repent of your sins, Acts 17, 30, and confess your faith in our Lord, then be baptized in his, by His authority for the remission of sins. That's how God's going to extend His mercy through His Son to you in the power of the gospel to save you from your sins. Then as a child of God, His mercy still is there, and if you... If you fail him as a child of God, he still wants to save you. But being free moral agents, we must in every case will to comply with his will, to enjoy his mercy, and then to show that mercy to others, we must emulate Christ in our daily lives. If you're then therefore subject to the gospel of Christ, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.